Amen. If you'll remain standing for the reading of God's Word, and any children kindergarten through first grade can be dismissed for Children's Church at this time. If you'll turn in your Bibles, if you don't have one, there's one in front of you, and I encourage you to turn to page 869 to Luke chapter 11 as we continue our exposition of the Gospel of Luke, as we return this day to the Lord's Prayer that the Lord taught us to pray. We'll begin in verse 1, looking specifically today at verse 2, but we will read the entirety of this passage. Verse 1, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Amen. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy, in all likelihood his last letter, his last epistle, that of 2 Timothy, writes this. Timothy, share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And then he gives several analogies. He says a soldier's aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete competes to win the prize. A farmer works to have the first share of the crops. And he says these analogies, these examples in rapid succession, soldier athlete, farmer. And then he says, Timothy, think over these things that I've said, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. What Paul is saying, really what the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle Paul in that passage is that there is purpose to life. As soldiers, athletes, farmers all have their purpose, their duty, their competing, their labor, is all done with a specific aim for a specific end. And that purpose has a reward. Namely, the the pleasure, the, the prize, or the payouts. If not, why do those things? Why be a good soldier, a hardworking athlete, or a diligent farmer if there's nothing to gain from it? And if that is true of these individuals, as Paul talks about, as a soldier, as an athlete, as a farmer, how about us? What is our purpose? As we go about whatever the Lord has called us to do in our various callings, what is the purpose that the Lord has given to us? And in fulfilling that purpose, is there a, a prize? Is there a reward, as it were? Well, indeed there is. And we as Reformed and Presbyterian believers have been given the unique privilege of growing up with that purpose ever before us. It comes in that first question and answer of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is man's chief end? Or you could say, what is man's chief purpose? And you know it so well, don't you? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. There we have the purpose, which is to glorify God, and there we have the, the prize or the privilege or the pleasure, is however you want to put it, to enjoy him and to do so forever. In many ways, it's the, the summary of existence, our existence, your existence in seven words. Five words if you remove the preposition and the conjunction. Glorify God, enjoy him forever. That's it, right there in a nutshell. And again, I I love the aspect that our forefathers added that word forever because that purpose does not end, does it? It's what we're called to do today and tomorrow and a week from now and 50 years from now and as long as the Lord would tarry. And in fact, we will be doing that for all of eternity. We'll be doing it forever. Why do I say all of these things? Well, as we come back today to what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer, we see that same structure. Jesus laying out the, the purpose as well as the, the pleasure 
of fulfilling that purpose. You have two halves of the Lord's Prayer. The, the first half, the, the hallowing of his name, the, the kingdom come, the, the will be done. We see this aspect of what we are called to do, which is to glorify God. And then the second half, the, the daily bread, the forgiveness of sins, the deliverance from evil is the, the privileges, or perhaps you could say the enjoyment that we have of being in relationship with him. And so again, you have those two aspects in this Lord's prayer, the purpose as well as the the privilege of fulfilling that purpose. In other words, this prayer is a worldview-changing prayer. It brings us back again and again to the purpose in God and the pleasure of God. And so this morning we will look at the first half of this prayer And then, Lord willing, next week, look at the second half of this prayer. Well, this morning, we want to see the first petitions in three points. The person of prayer, the purpose of prayer, and the petition of prayer. First, the person of prayer. Last week, we saw that this prayer comes as a request from one of the disciples, really all of the disciples, to teach them to pray a request which the Lord readily and joyfully complies to. Why? Because prayer is the lifeblood of any Christian, of any follower of Christ. It's as air is to the lungs, so prayer is to the Christian. We absolutely need it, don't we? We are completely depend upon it and depend upon Him because it's in Him that we live and move and have our beings and therefore We pray because we have to pray. But at the same time, as we said last week, it's not just a have to, but a get to, a desire to. A desire as we enter into this relationship with God, that all relationships are a reflection of the relationship that God has within the Trinity. We are relational beings Because God is a relational God, and he has made us in his image. He has made us to reflect him. And that is why, in the very beginning, when God created man and woman, when he created Adam, he said, it is not good that man be alone, and therefore created Eve. That is why God has given us marriage. That's why he's given us families. That's why he's given us friendship. But most importantly, he has given us himself. That almighty God condescends to us to be in relationship with us. And that really is what makes Christianity different from all other religions, doesn't it? That the creator God enters into a relationship with his creatures. In all other religions, that would be unfathomable. And yet we see that throughout the scriptures. We see that in the garden. We see that even as Adam and Eve fall and are banished from the garden, and yet God makes a covenant with them. And we see that covenant relationship displayed throughout the rest of the scriptures with Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and ultimately fulfilled in Christ. That covenant relationship is given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through relationship with him. And that is what the disciples saw in Jesus and the reason why they asked Jesus to teach them to pray because they saw Jesus communing with the Father. And they said, they want that. We want that. Jesus, teach us to have that. And Jesus says to them and says to you this day, absolutely. That is the very reason, that is the very purpose for why I have come. So do you see, even as we dive back into this subject of prayer, that prayer is one of the fruits of your redemption, one of the gifts. It's one of the very reasons why Christ came and died on the cross and was crucified and buried and rose on the third day it's so that we can come into relationship with God Almighty, that we can pray to the, the thrice holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a joy, what a privilege, isn't it, to enter into prayer, and we should see it as such. And Jesus, as we see in this prayer, teaches his disciples, teaches 
you and me how to pray. And notice how he begins. He tells us to address God as Father. As the first person of the Trinity is known and revealed as the Father. He is the Father because of his role within the Trinity. He is the Father because of his role within creation, but we primarily call him Father by virtue of adoption, through the new birth, through being born again. And therefore, when we are able to say the word Father, we need to understand that that word conveys tremendous grace. And we come to him ultimately because of that new birth. We don't come to him because we are born into a Christian family, children. We don't come to him because we have it by birthright, but we have it by his grace, by his blessing, by his mercy, by his regeneration. God has no grandchildren, nor is he a grandfather to any. Everyone must know him if they do know him as father. They have that direct relationship to him. The only way to come to the Father is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're brought near. We're brought into the household of God by the blood of Christ, and that is by grace alone. Yes, God is fatherly to all, but only those that are in the Lord Jesus Christ are able to call him Father. As Jesus says in John 14, 6, no one comes to the Father except through me. And so this term Father, this person that we approach, demonstrates his, his greatness, his nearness, his grace, his care. Because what Father, if he is a true Father, does not care for his own and if we would care for our own, how much more does our Heavenly Father care for us? In fact, we read that in Matthew 6, 8, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Instead of this being a deterrent to pray, this should be an encouragement for us to pray, to come to Him, because He knows us, and He takes care of us. He knows every need before we ask. In fact, He tells us, at least Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. He is our Father. He has revealed himself as such. He is to be known as such. He is to be addressed as such. Now I know in this day and age, that term Father can have mixed emotions, mixed feelings. Not everyone had a father in their life. Not everyone had a good father. But yet, if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you don't just have a good father. You have the greatest of fathers. One in which you have the privilege of coming into his presence day and night. One that cares for you. And as such, he redeems us as, as men and women that now are able to, to reflect him. And so even though you may not have seen it, maybe you didn't have it in your earthly parents, you can now have it through regeneration. And regeneration gives you a new start. It gives you a new beginning. You have a new relationship, a new bond, a new love, a new hope that is conveyed all through that term father. What a sacred privilege it is to call him father as adopted sons and daughters of, of God. It's also why we need no intermediate stewie or inter, inter, intercessories that go between us. We can go to the God directly. We don't need to go through a priest. You don't need to go through a pastor. You don't need to go through or pray to the saints. You don't need to pray to Mother Mary, do you? You can go directly to God in prayer. Christ has given us access to him. And therefore, even as Bobby prayed this morning in our call to prayer and, and our invocation that we would even come boldly because of that relationship that we have in God. Well, that is the purpose, or that is the person of prayer. Second, we see the purpose of prayer. This first petition is hallowed 
be your name. That word hallowed, we don't speak of much. We don't use that term. But it means to set apart, to sanction, to to glorify, to exalt. And to hallow his name, the, the name of God represents the whole of who he is. Now we can't capture the whole of who he is because he is infinite, but his name conveys his infinite nature. And so if I could paraphrase this first petition, it would be, Father, make the whole of you to have the whole praise and glory and honor that is due. Father, may the whole of you be given the whole praise and glory and honor that is due. Now, why is it that we would be praising or exalting God? Is it vain glory for us to exalt God? That God would desire praise, that he would desire glory, that he would desire worship from us? That would be a legitimate question if he was a man or if he was another created being or something that was created. In fact, that would be idolatry. But this hallowing, this praise, this glory, this worship is not giving something to God that he does not already have. He being God is already all glorious, infinitely so. He already is hallowed, hallowed as the one and only God. And so God is not gaining anything by us hallowing his name or worshiping or glorifying him as in if he didn't have it already. And so let us not think as we pray, as we worship, as we glorify God, that that God is, is getting something that he does not have already in himself. Paul tells us this in Acts 17, 25. He is not worshiped with mere hands as though he needed anything. So what is happening when we pray this prayer? We are praying that we, as well as all the world, would recognize who he is, would recognize his glorious revelation, and that would be made known throughout the earth, that there would be a a greater revelation, a greater knowing, a greater display in this earth of who our God truly is. Now, God has made himself known so much so that men are without excuse, Romans 1, but he has not made himself fully known. And that is by his grace, right? And mercy. Sinful man could not contain the whole of our God. You remember Moses asked God to see his glory. And you would think if there was anybody worthy enough to see the the fullness of God, it would be Moses. Moses. But what does God say even to Moses? No no man may see the fullness, the wholeness, the, the, the face of God and yet live. And so he hides Moses in the, the cliff of a rock and only sees the, the backside, as it were, the, the train of his robe. And yet what happens? Moses' face shines as a result. So God has hidden the fullness and the majesty, the glory of his being, but Also, man in his sinfulness and rebellion has suppressed even the knowledge of that which he has revealed. And so, hallowing the name of God is asking God to reveal as much as he is able to reveal to a sinful humanity that we and all of earth would receive that which is giving. So, hallowing God's name is not giving to God something that he does not have. It's, it's bringing us, rather, into alignment with who he already is and putting our hearts and our minds in that. Let me put it this way. In the sports word world, you, you've probably heard athletes say something like this. Game recognizes game, which is one way of one athlete recognizing the, the game or the athletic abilities of the other. And yet at the same time, it, it kind of puts them as equal. To, to have game, you need to, to recognize game, and you got to have that game to recognize the other person's game. And so it's, a, it's a, a way of giving a compliment, giving honor, but at the same time kind of honoring yourself, isn't it? Complimenting yourself. 
So when we're hallowing God's name, are we some ways trying to elevate ourselves or give ourselves a compliment? No, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? We're not putting us as equals with God, but actually holy as unequals with God. It is the unhallowed recognizing the hallowed one. It's the unholy recognizing the holy. It's the the finite recognizing the infinite. It's the unrighteous recognizing the righteous one. It's the creator recognizing the creator. It's the one that is dust recognizing the all-glorious one. And we could go on and on and on, but really in this first petition, it is putting us in right alignment with God that he is the true creator God and that we are the creature, that he is God and that we are not. And we need that reminder, don't we? That the world does not revolve around us, but rather we revolve around God and his purpose. And so this is a very much a worldview corrector, as I mentioned. This puts us and God in our proper place. And so do you see this aspect? It's so beautiful as Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, as he teaches us to pray, we have this aspect of telling us to call him Father, and yet at the same time, the true hallowed one. And so the name Father draws us close as it should, but hallowing his name recognizes who we are drawing close to. That we're drawing close to the Almighty, the all-glorious one. That yes, he is our Father, but he is not our buddy, or he is not our pal, or he is not just the the man upstairs. He is the magnificent, all-glorious King of kings and Lord of lords. And so our hearts draw near while at the same time our knees should quake as we approach him. You see how these two aspects put that proper tension that is needed in who our God is. One Bible commentator puts it this way. He tells the story of a Roman emperor coming back into Rome after a victory in battle. And the streets were lined to welcome the victorious soldiers, and specifically the victorious emperor back into Rome. And one little boy was not content to stand alongside the road, but rather ran towards the emperor's chariot, and a soldier stopped him and scooped him up and said, boy, do you not know who that is? That is the emperor. To which the boy says, he is the emperor, but he is also my father. For this was the little boy of the emperor himself. And it it puts that aspect of, yes, he is the emperor, but he is also my father. And that is the same way as we approach God, the mystery of entering into this relationship and communion with the father in prayer is that he is at the same time the sovereign God, the king of kings and lord of lords, and at the same time our father, drawing us near. Together it demonstrates the the eminence and the transcendence of God that we ought to have as we approach this relationship. So with asking God's name to be hallowed, what is it that we are asking? Well, first and foremost, I think that the name of God would be first and foremost hallowed in us. You remember when Chike G.K. Chesterton was asked to write a newspaper article answering the question, what is wrong with the world today? He wrote back, what is wrong with the world today? I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. That is true, isn't it? What's primarily wrong with me is that I do not hallow the name of the Lord. I don't live in this proper relationship as I ought to. I don't have this proper framework. And this hallowing of God's name puts again that single-minded, wholehearted devotion that we need for the Lord and in the Lord. And so praying that the the name of the Lord would be hallowed, it would be hallowed in, in me, in what I say, in what I think, and in what I do. The whole of me would be given 
to the whole of God in praise and worship. That is our, our purpose, isn't it? Even as we began, that is what well, must start with us and would be true of our families, Lord willing. Like Joshua says, for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We will give him honor and glory and praise. And so hallowing this name, I think it needs to start with, with you and me. Second, we would hallow the name and we would ask that the Lord would be hallowed in his church. Those that call upon the name of the Lord, those that the Lord has placed his name upon in the sacrament of baptism, as we've seen the last two weeks, as we're baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that we would represent that God on earth. That we as the church, and when I say church, I mean small C church, Smyrna Presbyterian church, but also the the big C church, the universal church, would be devoted to God and his purpose and his cause. That we'd be sanctified and, and set apart. We need to be reminded, and oftentimes I think we forget this, that who we are is far greater than what we do. Who we are in God and is far greater than what we can do for God. And I think God would place a higher importance upon that. Not that we aren't to, to do things for God and to give him glory, but who we are as sanctified and redeemed individuals would give God greater glory than what we are able to accomplish for his cause. Robert Murray McShane, which was a Scottish pastor in the 1800s, writes this. He's speaking to ministers, but it applies to all Christians. He says, how diligently the Calvary officer keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. McShane says, remember, you are God's sword, his instrument, a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name in great measure according to the purity and perfection of the instrument will be the success. He says, it's not great talent God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. And he finishes with this, a holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. A great weapon in the hand of God. And that is true, not of just ministers, but of all believers. That we would be hallowed unto his cause and unto his name. Third, we would ask that God's name be hallowed in the world. In North America, and South America, and Europe, and Africa, and Asia, and around the world. And that is what we're praying. God, reveal yourself. Perhaps better, remove the blinders that mankind has from seeing the glory that you have already demonstrated, the majesty and awe of who you are. Would you do that with my family? Would you do that with my coworkers? Would you do that with my neighbors? Would you show your purpose in their life? That they are created beings to glorify you and they'll never be satisfied, they'll never be content, they'll never be blessed until they do recognize that that is their purpose. That is their calling. So hallow your name. Do you see how this petition, and we could go on and on, puts our purpose in prayer, our purpose in life, our, our purpose, all of creation's purpose into its right perspective. It brings us back to the original meaning, the original way we were created. And that is to give God glory and praise. Well, third, then, we have the purpose of prayer. We have the petition of prayer. He goes on to say, let your kingdom come. And in many ways, I think all of these other petitions that we will see both this morning as well as next week are a fulfillment of that first petition, that your name would be hallowed. Well, how is God's name going to be hallowed? Well, it's going to come when his kingdom comes, as his kingdom is implemented in this life and in this world and in our hearts and in our minds, that God's rule and reign, that's what we mean by kingdom, his rule and reign would be extended on this earth under the rule and reign of Christ. Again, we're not praying something that's not true. It already is true. All of life is under the rule and reign of Christ. That's what we believe in the sovereignty of God. But ever since the fall, the world, the flesh, and the devil are in rebellion against that 
rule and that reign. And Christ has come to establish his own kingdom, the kingdom of this world. The kingdom that is being defeated, which is the kingdom of the devil and the kingdom of the flesh. This is praying, Christ, would would your kingdom utterly dominate that kingdom? Would it be brought into conformity? And that's how we should see the world. In fact, that's how we should pray for the world. Day by day, we are inundated with evil and evil acts, aren't we? And there is much, and many times it can be overwhelming. How should we think about those events in our lives, in the lives of others, in the life of this world? Well, our first thought shouldn't be, well, oh, that's too bad. Or that's terrible. Or that's traumatic. Yes, maybe that is our first response, but our second response should be, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done, even in this, even in this situation. Would you banish forever your defeated foe, Satan and his minions? Would you bring this earth and all of mankind under your domain? Do not let evil prosper. Rather, let your reign, let your peace overrule even this situation. That we as well as all of mankind would submit to you, would bow to you as king. Ultimately, he's praying, Jesus, come quickly. But if you tarry, please bless your people and bless your kingdom. We're praying for the kingdom to come. We're not praying that the kingdom would come by brute force or or through political powers or political actors or through the popularity of the masses or millions and millions of dollars that will bring about this kingdom. Rather, it's God bringing about his kingdom in his way. And God's kingdom and his way often works in very subtle and even silent manners, manners that are spiritual, things that cannot be seen and, and the means by which cannot be seen. Don't we see this throughout Scripture? Didn't we just see this in the Advent season? R.C. Sproul in the devotion book that we read this Advent said this, often God works in and through the little things that he chooses. The womb of a girl nobody has ever heard of. The hillside scattered with sheep. The town easily forgotten. A criminal's cross outside of the city. My life, your life. It's the little things, isn't it? But it is through the the little things, the little means that God does a most powerful and majestic work. Again, Jesus in Mark chapter four, speaking about the kingdom, says this, what can we compare the kingdom of God? Well, it's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground, it is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yeah, when it grows up, it becomes larger than all the garden plants. Puts out large branches so that the birds of the air may make its nest in its shade. Again, it's the mysterious work of God. That which starts small grows and grows and grows. Even though the rulers of this world and the, the kingdoms of this earth try to stop it, they cannot And that's what we have seen throughout church history. That is what we are seeing currently, aren't we, around the world. Where is it that the the church is being built up and the kingdom is extending? It's it's taking places in, in nations like China and Indonesia, in Africa and in Kenya. Places where we would say, humanly speaking, the church shouldn't be prospering, it shouldn't be flourishing. No, there's too much opposition. There's too much things that are standing in way of its growth, and yet what we see is greater the opposition, the greater the growth. That that kingdom is coming. That God is doing his work, that he is answering the prayer of his people. And that is true not just of the world out there, that's true of us as well. Just like the name of God would be hallowed. Would we too, as we pray that your kingdom would come, that we would be a part of that kingdom, that we have been transported from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the sun, and therefore we work for the king. We're the servants of the king. 
that we would have that kingdom perspective, that we would put on those, those kingdom goggles, as it were, kingdom glasses, that we'd see all of life from a kingdom perspective. So Lord, let me be about your kingdom. Let me be about the, the building of your church, the extension of your gospel, the rule and reign in me and in others and in every place. Would you see that as your task, once again, as we start this new year, the year of our Lord, 2024, that this wouldn't just be a task, that this just wouldn't be one thing, it would be the thing, it would be the task in all that we do. Let us be reminded that you ultimately don't work for your employer. Yes, you do work for them, do a good work, and, and, and please your boss, please your managers, and those that are above you, but have a greater perspective than just pleasing them that you are ultimately there to please the Lord and to do his work, that you are to, to provide goods and services that, yes, help your fellow man, but also glorify God, that extend his kingdom, that you would do all things to love your neighbor and serve your neighbor, but in all things serve God and please him. As Paul says, we don't live as men pleasers, but as God pleasers. Would that be the driving desire of our heart as we pray, your kingdom come? It'd be moms and dads raising children that love the Lord. As I mentioned, we have a parenting conference coming up. That's a noble task. That's kingdom building, isn't it? It's not something that will make the AJC or the annals of history, but it will be noticed by your heavenly Father. That is kingdom extension. And so we pray that his kingdom would come, his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, the prayer in Matthew teaches us. I'll finish with this. It'll all be fulfilled in Jesus coming back again, knowing that one day that all these things that we pray will be seen on earth as it is in heaven. And when he comes back again, it won't be silently, it won't be subtly. It will come with the, the sound of trumpets and archangels. As Revelation 21 says, a, a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Beloved, as we approach the table this morning, would our hearts and our minds, as a result of this prayer, be captured with the, the person and the purpose and the petitions that we ought to be praying and ought to be filling our hearts and filling our minds, these God-exalting, God-glorifying prayers because that fits in the purpose for which we are called and that which we have been given in Christ, that his name would be hallowed, that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done, and it would be done in me, it would be done in you, it would be done in this church, and it would be done in this world, all until he comes again. When we join in this prayer, what a prayer to pray as we think of how great is our God. Well, let's pray even now. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this perspective. And we come even now as we approach this table confessing that oftentimes we don't have that perspective. We don't have the, the God-glorifying, God-exalting prayers and thoughts that we should. And so, Lord, first and foremost, we pray that we have a view that is too small. Would you give us this day a, a view that is much greater of a God that is high and lifted up, that is exalted, the train of your robe filling the temple, your infinite being that is greater than all of the heavens and all of the earth. In fact, the heavens and the earth cannot contain the greatness of who you are. Would we come, Lord, this day in fear and trembling, but would we come also boldly because we can come in the name of Christ calling you Father because of the blood and righteousness of Christ that draws us near 
It draws us even to this table as you meet, eat, and commune with your people through this Lord's Supper. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of calling you Father, of entering into prayer, even as we do now. For we pray this in Christ, our Savior's name. Amen.